Hi there, my name is Daniel Silk. I'm a political economy analyst and I serve a number of clients with presentations on the global African and South African economy and the political connections to that economy. I like to draw a link between politics and economics. Now, uh, the times that we are in are unprecedented. Uh, the coronavirus is affecting every single aspect of business, the broader economy clearly, and probably also will have profound political implications over the course of the next few years or so. What I want to do with you here in the short videos, provide you just some of the updated issues that I'm covering in my presentations. Uh, it's something of a moving target, I must tell you. And uh, I think for every analyst, every hour of the day presents new data, new research, and of course, new nuances and trend lines to follow. So it's quite difficult to get a complete handle on where we are at at the moment, but I'll do my best just to give you a very short sampler of some of the issues that I'm covering uh, with clients currently. So sit back and relax if you can, and I'll just take you to a few of my more relevant slides that I'm going to uh, introduce you to. Uh, firstly, let me just say that um, it, it doesn't matter you know, how clever you think you are. There are many, many variables in this broader discussion, and we simply don't have the answer for many of them as I sit here on the 1st of April. The first key issue that will influence whatever we do in the next 18 months or so is the issue of a suitable vaccine for COVID-19. Now that can be a game changer, obviously, and obviously for the better. But in the absence of a vaccine at the moment, we clearly are in a very unstable period. And given that a vaccine can take up to 18 months, that instability will probably last at least 18 months as we battle to get huge quantities of a suitable vaccine rolled out to most of the world. Uh, with the stagnation in business, clearly, it means a very rocky environment. But the good news is that there's a race to find a vaccine, and that certainly is underway. Secondly, the big variable to me, is certainly in the more short term, is even if we put a lid on the uh, incidence of, uh, of, of COVID-19 in the short term, even if we flatten the curve, as it is, so to speak, it can rear its head, particularly in the Northern Hemisphere's winter months, November, December of this year, and perhaps even, to, even into early next year. So we are likely to see, to some degree, the regulations on our personal liberties and freedoms and freedoms of movement, the social distancing that we're beginning to become acquainted with, we are likely to see that maintained in part, perhaps in a stop-start fashion, over the course of the next six months or so, creating a very difficult environment until one really gets a handle on keeping this under control. We are con going to continue to see high levels of volatility and high levels of insecurity as well. The third variable to me is more on the medical side, on the virus side. What is the, the nature of the virus and can it mutate? Can there be different versions of the virus that can in fact delay a suitable vaccine? That's something for the scientists and virologists to talk about, but it can be a uh, factor that uh, delays recovery. Uh, so you know, when you take those three big issues, they really are disclaimers that whatever one says is certainly dependent upon some very big issues uh, that specialists will be looking at over the next six months or so, right now and over the next six months. But let, let's just go to what we know, because what we can deal with are the facts currently presented. Um, and I'm just going to use two charts from the Financial Times, an excellent source, by the way, for you. Uh, some of this coronavirus information is now available complimentary on their website. But I just want to indicate to you that, uh, you know, the worst is still to come in terms of the amount of deaths that we are going to see. Uh, it's tragic, but I suppose from an analytical point of view, it's not surprising because we've had a buildup of cases for the last two months or so. Those cases are resulting in a number of hospitalizations, and clearly of that, there are a number of deaths, and some very dramatic death rates coming out of Italy and Spain, unfortunately, probably from the United Kingdom, and certainly from the United States, where anywhere above 100,000 deaths could well occur just in the course of the next few months or so. So from an analytical point of view and a business point of view, the next four to eight weeks are going to be the worst. And you've simply got to expect a plethora of terrible statistics and news reports to come your way through every medium in this next period. We are almost at the pinnacle of this first stage of the pandemic, and therefore it really is going to get worse before it gets better. 
getting better is important and it's not just important because we think that we can get better there is are some statistics that indicate that these curves are beginning to flatten we are starting to see a reduction in the rate of increase of new confirmed cases and that is encouraging albeit only at an initial stage and you can just see there those uh, new rates of the virus in Italy are beginning to soften a little bit. In other words, a lower percentage on a daily basis are becoming confirmed cases. Uh, you can see the same occurring in Spain. Even in the US at a rather dismal level, I might add, in terms of total numbers of confirmed cases, there is something of a, a softening of the curve there. We haven't quite seen it in the UK as yet. Uh, but uh, it is at least a positive trend that perhaps we're just at the beginnings of. So we'll watch that and hope that that will continue into the future. But clearly the big effect, uh, other than on, on health and on uh, the families of those who face complete disruption as a result of this, uh, has been on the broader global economy. Uh, it's been so rapid, and that's been the key feature here. The rapidity of the complete decline in both the supply and production side of the economy has left large parts of the world simply locked down under extreme social distancing regulations. It stopped business in its tracks. And you can just see here from this first of the many graphs that we are going to see over the next uh, few months or so, which measure um, the various economic indicators on which we base our projections, you can just see and just look at that spike in US unemployment claims on the right hand side of that graph. Uh, it just hasn't been seen for the last 40 years or so when you look at this particular timeline. And of course we know the social implications for unemployment are dramatic, additional pressure on state coffers to provide benefits, and there are also deep-rooted social implications within families as well. Mental health well-being is going to be a feature of discussion, and the state is going to have to deploy many, many resources to combat the negative effects. This is all going to be borne out in the broad GDP figures for the world this year. Most of the research houses are forecasting a global recession, which really means negative growth for at least two quarters. Uh, when you look at this projection from uh, Moody's, you'll see that they are projecting the United States at a minus 2% GDP figure for 2020. I mean, that's astonishing given the exceptional growth we've seen in the US over the last decade or so. Similarly, so minus 2.6% GDP in the UK, minus 3% in Germany, uh, and uh, China's growth expected to halve from just under 6% to perhaps 3% or so. I mean, these are very dramatic declines. And uh, in the Southern Hemisphere, where we have perhaps more developing economies, you can just see Brazil in recessionary territory and uh, South Africa, uh, where I am based, already suffering as a result of a recession, going into an even deeper and perhaps more long-lived recession for the rest of the year or so. It is my view that uh, it may not just be quarter two and quarter three where there's negative growth. We might even see negative growth still in quarter four, although that's going to be based upon some of the variables that I've mentioned earlier. So a very difficult ride for the world in 2020 with only a moderate uptick in 2021. Just a quick uh, message to my fellow colleagues across the African continent, you are indeed more vulnerable. Uh, we all know that uh, medical supplies on the continent, state healthcare sectors are very poor in terms of available ventilators, uh, in terms of hospital beds per thousand head of the population. Living conditions are poor, large families, multi-generational families living in relatively small square meterage space in many favelas and shanty towns in these urban conurbations around the African continent. And of course, African countries just don't have the institutional firepower, uh, the ability to uh, uh, inject capital into their economies uh, without borrowing extensive amounts from international global agencies. So uh, that uh, power of the fiscus, those uh, cash reserves, just not available that uh, compared to what they would be in the United States or in the EU for that matter. And even for the wealthy countries like the US and the EU, they probably will have to put in a number of further tranches of uh, financial aid into their respective economies 
Africa won't be able to do it. It will be a case of having to borrow even more on already over indebted balance sheets within their economy. Finally, this is a, a slide, it's a complex slide, it's got a lot of detail in it, and it's one that I would go through in much more detail with the client uh, and, and, and flesh out some of the many variables and perhaps look at with the client how they see their business fitting in to these nine different scenarios in terms of the overall economic impact of COVID-19. Uh, there are three sort of different horizontal lines here. The top line indicates the better predictions. The middle line indicates the uh, average predictions, perhaps the iffy predictions, perhaps the realistic predictions in my book. And uh, the bottom horizontal three uh, options uh, indicates the more negative or worst case scenarios that could apply. Now, I think different industries are going to have different levels of impact of COVID-19. And clearly those industries that are service-based, that are in the travel, hotel, leisure markets, those are going to be particularly hard hit for an extended period of time. Uh, aspects of retail will as well, but aspects of retail providing essentials will have a different trajectory path to recovery. Uh, so there's not a one size fits all here. Just to quickly highlight to you, and let me just get the highlighter uh, here since I'm highlighting, um, just three scenarios that I would like to suggest to you. Um, the better scenario here where your virus is uh, contained and there's a slow recovery there taking us to where we almost were at the beginning of the year. Well, that's a more optimistic view in my view. Uh, I'm not sure that I necessarily agree with it. The more pessimistic view here at the bottom indicates that the pandemic escalates and as a result of that escalation there's very slow progress we bottomed out for a long time i mean this is a little bit like a, an l-shaped recovery where you have a sharp downturn and you just have a flat line almost until there's eventually some kind of recovery that's pretty grim and i don't necessarily buy into that although i do think that there will be some industries that may well find their path more akin to this rather negative scenario. The one that I think perhaps for me anyway, at the moment on the 1st of April is this one that we should look at and concentrate more on. It really shows that uh, where we have this virus, we have this uh, drop in business activity, uh, this uh, flatlining, which is represented here on the graph. But as we grapple to uh, manage the virus until a vaccine is found, we have many ups and downs over an elongated period. And I think you can see here that this graph sort of waxes and wanes up and down, starts to show some green shoots and sort of ends where we just sort of can breathe again. But that's only in my view, after a successful vaccine has been rolled out uh, and after rescue packages have found real effectiveness in their respective economies. So there's some ifs to this one as well, but frankly, I put a three year, if not longer time frame on getting to where we are from now to um, a world that looks a little bit better, but it may well be a different world. And that's something to discuss as well. So, you know, I hope that it's given you some food for thought in a sense uh, as to some of the issues that I'm going to cover. Uh, it's a very fast changing environment. I, I don't think any of us analysts have lived through uh, such dramatic times where the permutations of the future look so different. Uh, I would be wary to rewrite history already, I must tell you, but I do think that we are looking at a fundamental shock to the system that's going to take a number of years to come right. And even then, we are going to see some fairly dramatic changes in the way we do business and talk politics after this pandemic has been controlled. My name is Daniel Silk. My website, www.danielsilkglobal.com. I hope you'll join me, uh, perhaps for more detailed briefings, and I'll be updating this over the course of the next few weeks as well online. Thank you very much for listening to me and taking time out from your schedule to uh, perhaps get some information from this presentation.